Revelation never ceases to amaze me. Every time I study or teach this book, I learn new things. It's like one of these Russian nested dolls. They just keep going and going and going and going on and on. Oh, look what I found in here. There's a dragon inside my nested doll. Very apocalyptic. If you haven't watched my first three videos on Revelation, then I would suggest you go back and watch them now. And I'll have a link to them in the show more section underneath this video. In those videos, I go through how Revelation is a very complex book and the four ways that the church has read and interpreted Revelation over the past 2000 years very big picture sort of stuff regarding Revelation. That changes in this video. We're going to zoom in and take a micro look at the seven letters to the seven churches in chapter two and three. Or are they letters? Hmm. So let's grab some coffee, get caffeinated, and jump into this very caffeinated book within the New Testament, Revelation. You're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to encourage and stimulate your understanding of the Bible by taking what I've been teaching in seminaries and graduate schools for the past 20 or 30 years and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you find these videos stimulating, please subscribe and hit the little bell button. That way YouTube will let you know every time I post a new video. And do me a favor and give it a thumbs up and share these videos with your friends and family. That helps me grow the channel. Enough said, let's get into Revelation. Let's see, you gotta get to the book of Revelation here. In the book of Revelation, seven is a big number. It opens in one one where it lets us know that this book is an apocalypse which I covered in my first video on Revelation. 1-1 one, one starts off with the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's a bad translation in my book. John tells us in the very first word in the Greek, what type of book this is. It's an apocalypse. Then we have the first of many sevens in this book. In 1-4 it says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. In 1-11, instead of saying to the seven churches, he lists them out by name. Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. John then turns around and he sees the voice of the person speaking to him in the middle of seven lampstands, and in his right hand he holds the seven stars of the churches. The Son of Man then explains to John what he has seen as follows. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John employs the number seven as a symbolic number in the book of Revelation, and also structurally for literary units within this book. There are series of seven, for example, the seven seals on the scroll in chapters six through eight, the seven trumpets, chapters eight through 11, and then the seven bowls in chapter 16. Now, where did the seven churches that John is writing to come from? Acts provides a basic explanation for this. During Paul's ministry in Ephesus, which lasted two years, his ministry extended to the surrounding cities within that region as well. Acts 19.10 says, All the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Now the question comes up, why only seven churches? He could have mentioned more churches. I think the reason why he only picked seven churches is because these were the more important cities or churches, and this allowed him to create his sevenfold template that he uses throughout this book. If you study Revelation and the Gospel of John, one thing you can definitely say is that John likes to be very careful about how he crafts his books. But that really doesn't answer my question. Why these seven churches and in this order? Last week, I talked about how a preterist view, that is, we interpret Revelation according to the historical and cultural background and context of John's day, is the dominant way that Revelation is interpreted by scholars today. And I gave you a guideline for any interpretation of Revelation that you might come up with. That is, 
Would that interpretation make sense to someone in John's day? Would they have understood what you're talking about? For example, if we take the idea that the mark of the beast is some sort of computer chip that's implanted in us or a barcode that's tattooed on our body somewhere, that would have been complete nonsense to someone in John's day. So we should probably put that idea aside or in the rubbish bin. But what about these seven churches in this order? Well, this is where a Bible atlas really comes in handy. And I've talked about these in other videos as well. First, let's take a look at a map of what is now Western Turkey in the Aegean Sea. And I'm actually going to use the atlas on my iPad here because it's a little bit easier. John is writing from the island of Patmos where he's been exiled. And he's writing back to the churches in the region that he was overseeing. If we look at these seven churches on the map, we see that the first church that is mentioned is Ephesus. And I think it's natural for him to mention Ephesus because this is where he lived according to the early church fathers. Then we have Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So what, you ask? That doesn't tell me much except where they're at. But if we overlay the Roman roads on this map, then we have something interesting to notice here. If John wrote this book to be read in all of the churches, then it was most likely carried by his personal representative or emissary. Paul often did this as well. Some of his letters were written to multiple churches, and so they were circular letters that went around from church to church. And like Paul's letters, Revelation is a circular document as well. It's written for multiple churches. Now notice what the roads show us. If someone set out from Ephesus and gone on a round trip to all seven of these churches, they would have gone from Ephesus, followed the road to Smyrna, from there to Pergamum, then they would have turned inland to Thyatria, and followed the river valley up to Sardis, then Philadelphia. After this, they would have crossed a low pass to Laodicea. These seven churches all lie upon the major Roman roads during that day. They are not in this order to represent different historical time periods according to the historicist view, where Ephesus represented the early church and then Smyrna represented the church during the medieval period. They are the seven churches that are on the main roads that John's letter carrier would have walked. So understanding the history and the cultural background helps us to see things about this book that an allegorical or dispensational reading does not. Okay, enough about the atlases and maps, but I should give you a heads up that ever since I was a teenage kid, I really loved maps. I would collect them out of National Geographic and everything. I had a drawer in my desk that was full of maps at that time, and I loved studying them to see the information you can get off of. But now we need to turn our attention to the seven letters. I hinted in the introduction that they may not be letters. In fact, I don't believe that they are letters at all. If they're not, then what are they? A typical letter during that day would have contained a prescript with the formula of A to B, for example, John to the Ephesians, then a proreme, a prayer, the main body, a benediction, and finally close with a prayer or a greeting. See my videos I'll have over here on how to write a New Testament letter where I go into the aspects of Greco-Roman letters. These letters in Revelation are rather different. Scholars have tried to classify these letters for quite a while. First, they thought they were letters, but that view was rather leaky and didn't hold much water because they just don't fit the category of a letter well at all. So what are they? Well, the closest parallels that we have found are imperial edicts or proclamations from Caesar or a very high ranking official. If you look at these seven letters in chapters two and three of Revelation, you'll notice that they follow a pretty tight pattern. One, they open with the command to write. It's almost as if Jesus is dictating the edict to John, who was then functioning in the position of his royal scribe. Then you get this phrase, these are the words of, with some very creative description of Christ that follows afterwards. Third, this is followed by the formula, I know, dot, dot, dot. 
This introduces a narration of the church in that city, the factions and the divisions in those churches, and how they are fully known by Christ. After this, you get Christ's proclamation to that church. And fifth, they close with a promise of victory, often accompanied with the phrase, let anyone who has an ear to hear, listen. David Oni, who did a lot of study on the book of Revelation and did a very thorough study of imperial edicts about 30 years ago, concluded that these letters in the book of Revelation share a similar structure to the imperial edicts. There's a number of features that they share in common. First, they both start by giving the title and a description or who is dictating this edict. Number two, both use phrases like, I know. This is used to show that the roar understands his subject's situation and is attentive to where they live. They have not avoided the eyes of their emperor. Third, behind the imperial edicts stood the authority of the Roman Empire. So the people or the cities that these edicts were addressed to did not have a choice as whether they would follow them or not. And then finally, both close with a promise from the ruler that if they are faithful to commands in this edict, there's a few differences between these imperial edicts and the ones in Revelations 2 and 3. First, these edicts in Revelation are addressed to the angels of the churches. The use of angel here functions as a representative for that church. God doesn't need to tell John to write something to tell the angel what to do. The command to write at the start of each of these seven edicts in Revelation is also rather unique. It gives a very dramatic and visual flair to these edicts. You can imagine, here's Jesus speaking to John. He's writing this and it's going to go to those seven churches. It's a very dramatic picture. And as opposed to royal proclamations, the name of the sender is never directly given in Revelation 2 and 3. In an imperial edict, they would have something like, I, Domitian, emperor of the Roman Empire, the one who gives peace to the empire. I know the challenges that you face in Ephesus, yada, yada, yada. And the closing statement that's in, I think, five of these edicts in Revelation 2 and 3 of let anyone who has ears listen really has no close parallels in other literature, even imperial edicts. That is, except the conclusion of some of Jesus' parables, where you get, let him who has ears hear. And I think John's readers would have recognized that at the end of each one of these edicts. In each of these edicts, we get a circumlocution, or roundabout way to identify the authority behind these edicts. To the Ephesians, he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. We never get the name of Jesus or Christ as the sender of these edicts. Now this does two things. First, in each of these edicts, a beautiful word picture of the one sending the edict is created. For example, in the edict to Smyrna, Jesus is identified as, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And to Thyatira, he writes, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Second, I think John intended us not to read these seven edicts in isolation, but as a cumulative whole. In this case, the impact of the seven descriptions as a whole, we see Jesus as the risen, exalted Lord who is on the throne of David and has complete authority over the earth. Chapters 2 and 3 contain the seven edicts to the churches. These are not typical letters, but are more like imperial edicts that would have been sent from Caesar to a Roman city. As citizens of the Roman Empire, the members of these churches would have been very familiar with imperial decrees and proclamations sent out from Rome. They would have heard them read in the marketplace, the agora, or in their theaters. John wants the churches to realize that just as they are under the human emperor in Rome, they also serve an eternal emperor enthroned in heaven. Revelation was written by John to churches that were either undergoing or about to undergo persecution. The persecution that they would have experienced would have come from the Roman authority. 
Now imagine sitting in one of these churches when Revelation would have been read for the first time. You might be frightened or very anxious about your current situation and what the Roman authorities might decide. Then suddenly you hear these seven imperial edicts coming not from Rome, but from the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. Not only should this strengthen their faith, but it also challenges them and us as well. They are given a direct command and summons for how to live their life and stand strong. And if we take these seven edicts as a whole and read through them, they challenge us today as well. Here are three short exercises that you can apply and you can do one or all of them. First, take a look at the seven edicts in Revelation chapter two and three. See if you can spot the five elements of each edict. And I'll list the five elements over here to help remind you of them. Second, take a look at the way that Jesus is described in each of these edicts. And then see if you can write a short summary that includes all the elements from each edict. It's a great exercise to see the majesty of the risen Lord. Finally, as you look at these seven edicts, which of these challenge you the most? Now, Jesus' judgment to the Laodiceans that they are lukewarm and he is about to spit them out of the mouth really hits me pretty hard. How about you? Which one of these edicts challenges you and your life? I would love to hear your thoughts on these three little exercises in the comments underneath this video. And it's probably going to take one person out there to step up and post their ideas first. And usually you can tell it's you because you got that queasy or uneasy feeling in your stomach. So step up and post a comment. Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace.